Well, have a seat, have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Whew, good catch there. Oh, that, that. All right, what a beautiful morning. What a beautiful spring day. My daughter wanted to celebrate spring, so she dressed me in some very uh, vibrant colors. Those of you with daughters, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I always like to start my sermons with just giving a thanks, and I want to thank all of you for creating the family atmosphere that we're starting to build here at Athel Baptist. Uh, for those of you that were here for the Tenebrae service and those that came for the Seder, Heritage Days, all that stuff, even if you're not one of the ones who's here leading it, by you being part of it, you're being part of that family atmosphere we'll, we're building. You know, I was actually talking with someone because I have three small kids, and us building family and community here is so important because when my kids leave my house, I need them to know that they go to find community in the church. So thank all of you who are committing to this church to make it part of your family. Now today, I'm doing something that most pastors absolutely fear to do, and that's try to preach on women. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, brave or stupid, one of the, one of the ones. That's funny, it didn't, uh, the font's going to be all messed up, it looks like, based off mine, but we'll work with it. So for today, we are going to talk about honoring women, because we've talked about here at Athel Baptist, our goal this year is to make some noise. I have felt that my role in this as uh, the lefty pastor is I want to focus on the foundations, the fundamentals, so that we know what it is, who we are, so we can make some noise. My previous two sermons, I talked about the essentials of the faith, how it is you know that you hold to the facets that make you a believer. All right, so that has passed on. Now we're going to the family. The most important unit of the church is the family. We're going to start out with ladies, ladies first. I'll go on to men, and then I'll end my sermon series sometime in October about talking the church. Oh, man, that, that font is much different on my laptop. <laughs> oh, wow. So this will be fun. My apologies for that. Uh, as Tim was, so, <laughs> so funny story. Uh, <clears throat> so those of you that know me know that I probably have a little too much on my plate. Um, and I get comfortable at, at not doing stuff well. It's just, I don't, um, that's just my style. So we did this race yesterday that was called the Lead Man out at Silver Mountain. And you like, you skied down. Then you jumped on a mountain bike, and you mountain bike down, and then you ran. And I was telling Tom that the mountain bike was absolutely atrociously, like, dangerous. Like, I don't downhill mountain bike a lot, but downhill mountain biking is a whole different beast because you basically just go very fast and try not to wreck your bike as you're bouncing over ruts and rocks. And, and on the way back, I looked at my wife, and I'm like, man, I really underestimated that, that mountain bike portion. And she's like... No, to underestimate means you did some preparation. <laughs> well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. <laughs> so I failed to check to make sure that the PowerPoint font would go across. So that's my bad. I do apologize for that. But <clears throat> we'll still go with it anyway. All right, so why... Let's first talk about women. You see on your notes there, I've, I put a few things there on the bottom. Culture is insane right now. We need, women are being attacked on such a myriad of fronts. I, I imagine some of you that have a little bit more life experience than me thought that you would never see what you're seeing today. Probably never thought in your life we would be dealing with the issues that we are dealing today, and especially at such a rapid rate that it is. You see there in the notes I've talked about, our society is trying to teach men to nullify biology. As if I can just put on a dress or I can 
put some body parts on me, and that makes me a woman somehow. I mean, that is the lunacy of our society right now. That is what how this alternate lifestyle stems from. The next way that women are being attacked is we have this huge culture in, I would say in response to feminism in a way, but we're creating alpha males. And now let me define my terms, what I mean when I say alpha male. Now obviously there's alpha male in terms of a strong male is how that's usually meant. That's not what I'm trying to say. Those of you who have young boys, you really need to look into this kind of movement. Alpha male movement is trying to create, teach men to basically be jerks just so they can go out and have sexual conquest. It is a huge movement in the culture right now that the secular society is telling our young men to objectify sexuality, that you need to, to score with women, you basically need to be a jerk, have a lot of money, and just be selfish. And if you have young boys, you need to be mindful of this, you need to be preparing them, because this is the current that they're going to face. Now, I know the objectification of sexuality has been there since the dawn of time. But I think the difference in today's age is there's no shame that goes with that. There's a celebration of the objectification now. So it's very dangerous for the gal because now not only does she have men trying to be women, she's got men who are just going to do whatever they can do just to score, so to speak. Now, the third way that women are being attacked from the male side is that we have vilified monogamy, right? As if monogamy is some end of the game, end of the video, some prison that you're going to go into, and that at all costs, you must avoid it. And even those that get married, we allow them to just let the wife take control, as if the man has no responsibility like, I have a controlling wife, she does it. It's, you're still responsible in God's eyes. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. So recognize, and next week we're going to get into how females are attacking females. So this week I just want to focus on how the secular society is teaching men to attack women. We want to raise men of God at this church. We want our boys to become men of God. And so that starts out with the husbands, all right? So today I'm going to focus on smacking the men around for a little bit, um, myself included. So much of what I preach comes from self-reflection, <laughs> you know? I think I've heard a pastor say, you don't want to know what a pastor struggles with, listen to what he preaches. Um, and this is true. This is all, you know, this is something I strive to do better in my, in my own life. Uh, it's still a work in progress. All right, so as we start, let's turn to the Bible to get the word. Um, it, uh, uh, I, I know a lot that you want big font, and I use, there was big font before this, so. It's perfect there, yeah, sorry. Hey, so when you watch it online, it'll be good. Just uh, that system didn't work. All right, so here we are in 1 Peter. If you want to follow along in chapter 3, I'm going to start out with verse 7. Let me start my timer here. Tim gave me a little extra time. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> uh, thank you, see? Uh, you know how I roll. All right, 44 minutes. Here we go. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and it's being hairs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. That went somewhere. Oh, man. It's missing the whole thing. All right, I'll read from my Bible then, because that didn't come over well. So if you're new to the Bible, if you go to the end, you'll find Revelation. Go a little bit forward to that. You'll run into the epistle of Peter. There we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah, that was right. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you're called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. 
Now I want to anchor on this for a second. There's a specific reason. There's a lot of relationships we could talk about when it comes to biblical men and biblical women. But I want to focus on the husband's relationship to the wife because I don't know if you've ever sat around to think about this, but the husband by far has the most influential power of any person in God's creation. And that's biblical. You look at, with me at the Colossians 1.18, it says, and he, speaking of Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now you come over to Ephesians 5, 23 through 24, this is where the link is. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of the body, therefore just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So according to the Bible, the husband is one of the only roles where God specifically says, you will be exactly like me. So the husband should be the one who reflects Christ in that life. You know, the nation of Israel, their purpose was to be a guiding light for all the uh, apostate nations, all the pagan nations, and they failed at that. We as a husband, we are called to reflect Christ in our familial relationship, and that is what people to the church. Now, everybody gets caught up on the submission aspect. Like, there is a lot of honor that goes with that. But I think sometimes people miss the responsibility, the requirement, and the risk that's there for the husband. Think of the responsibility. In the garden, who took of the fruit? Who ate the fruit first? Eve, who's gotten all the blame for it? Adam, show me anywhere in the New Testament where it says Eve took of the fruit. The husband is responsible. You know, when you look at the Levitical law, it does not apply to us because we're not the nation of Israel, we're not in a theocracy. But you, when you read about Levitical law, you can see the mind of Christ and how the mind of God works. Specifically in Numbers 30, it talks about when a husband comes home, if his wife or his daughter has made an oath, the first time he hears that oath, he can, he can nullify that oath right then and there. He has that power. But he also has a responsibility. If he does not nullify that oath, he is responsible for fulfilling it. And back to what I said about men that are absent in their own marriage. God doesn't care. You're still responsible. When I was in the Navy, and I remember I was flying off the carrier, and I got to talk to uh, one of my former commanding officers to become the air boss, which was the guy, if you've ever seen Top Gun, that guy who yells at Maverick all the time. Nobody? <laughs> Maybe I'm just the only guy that watches Top Gun every week. Um, so I'm up in the tower. It's like 2 in the morning. We're out doing carrier qualifications, and I'd finished mine, so I went up to talked to my former uh, executive officer, just, just hadn't seen him in a while. And, and it was kind of cool. He was the air ball. So he's like, you know, he's in control, all the flight ops on the carrier at night. And something kind of went a little sideways, not bad, but just something. And, and he gets a phone call. And it's the captain of the ship. And he hangs it up. And I'm like, wow. He, and he's like, yeah. He's like, that guy is up like 22 hours a day, 20 hours a day. Because if anything happened to that carrier, it didn't matter who did it. The lowest seaman to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vite, that captain of the ship was responsible for what that carrier did. Every aspect of it. If it ran aground, if it hit another boat. We are no different as husbands. If you choose to let your wife run the finances, if you choose to let your wife do, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying, God, in God's eyes, you are responsible for your family. How you want to run it is between you and God. I'm not here to tell you how to run your family, but I'm here to tell you that the responsibility for your family is yours. You cannot give that responsibility to your wife. Now, the second piece of the requirement, and this is what people miss, they, get, they stop at 
524. They don't read the rest of the passage, which says, Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So my criteria for being a good husband is to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Have you ever thought about that? How did Christ love the church? Like, he basically lived out in the wilderness, starved, um, wandered around, dedicated himself wholly, and eventually gave his life for her. Like, that's a pretty high standard. That is your standard. As, that is what God has commanded, that you love your wife as God loves the church. That's why I always laugh when people get caught up about the whole wife submitting. I'm like, I've been in the military police. I can fall an idiot. I've done it many a time. It's easy. All right? The responsibility that is on each of us as husbands is huge. And again, let's go back to the mind of Christ. Here in Luke 17, it says, this is Jesus talking, and which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk? And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he think that servant because he did the things were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. So Christ has just said, when you just simply do your duty, you might as well say, I'm a worthless servant because I have only done what I'm supposed to do. I mean... Maybe I'm the only one sat, really sat down and thought about this. Is like, my commandment is to love my wife as Christ loved the church. And if I only do what is commanded to me, God's like, you're a worthless servant. You didn't go above and beyond what you were supposed to do. Now, I'm starting off with this, not to give ammunition for the wives to beat your husband over the head. I'm telling you as wife, so you understand that just like you were called, like Eve was called the helper, which we'll get into in the next sermon, that is akin to the Holy Spirit, to come alongside your husband because you recognize the responsibility that is on his shoulders, the requirements that he is held to. I truly believe as husbands, we will receive a much sterner judgment when it comes for our life's works to be examined. I am 100% convinced of this. It is biblical. So you need to come alongside your husband and recognize what it is he has to do for you and your family. Now, I know a lot of husbands out here there, and I know I would say it, which is like, how in the world can I love Christ, love my wife like Christ loved the church? You can't. But you know who can? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit that lives in your life, he is the one who will give you the power. He will give you the love. He will give you the mercy to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That is why if you're not a believer, nothing that I'm going to preach about is going to help you. What I'm referring to and what we're going to talk about is a biblical marriage. If you're not a believer, there's nothing I can do for you. I have counseled friends before who were getting divorced and trying to explain to them that without Christ, I, cannot, I don't know how you're going to forgive your wife. I don't know how you're going to have grace. I don't know how you're going to have mercy. I don't know. I can only claim that stuff in my own marriage because the Holy Spirit provides it for me. And isn't that such amazing grace? God tells us, I want you to love Christ, love like the church. But he doesn't just leave us. He gives us himself to do it. He says, you must be perfect to come into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to die for you and give you my perfect blood so you can come in. What an amazing God we have what an amazing religion biblical Christianity is. And praise his name 
that he provides us with what we need. We just need to go and seek it from him. So let's turn back to 1 Peter 3. So how do we become biblical men? How do we step up and love our wives like Christ loved the church? I think we've turned there to uh, 1 Peter 3, 7. It says, giving honor to the wife. So there's kind of three ways that I've lined out that we as biblical men can give honor to our wives. The first way, we prize their beauty. We prize her beauty. Now, this has an external and an internal aspect. This external aspect, fairly easy. You know, if you've been married, you've had the joys of a, of a beautiful wife, uh, nothing beats it, right? I mean, how hard is it to love a beautiful wife? I mean, that's just, that's easy. <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, all right, I got to get focused again. Okay, so... Uh, in my opinion, the challenge with appreciating the physical beauty of our wife in today's age is not so much the appreciation of a gorgeous woman who is our wife. It is the exclusion of our attention upon others. Think about this. Job said, Proverbs 31, 4, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How could I gaze at a virgin? Today's world is insane. A few years ago, I, I remember standing in a Barnes and Noble line. To, I was buying a Bible, and I'm standing in line to get a Bible. And like along the thing there, there was some swimsuit magazine and some gal who was obviously um, shaped. And all she had on was beads. And this is like, and I'm sitting there thinking like, how in the world is a 14 year old boy, like what? Like, the, just the hyper sexualization of our society is out of control. If you have young boys, this is terrifying for you. We should be praying for this. To truly appreciate the beauty of our wives, though, we have got to be disciplined with our eyes our mind, and our heart. All sexual gratification should be funneled through our wife. And in today's era, it is so hard because the world knows that it's how you destroy men. It's how you destroy churches. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to turn there to Proverbs 5. <laughs> Starting there, 15, it says, drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the streets, streams in the public squares, they should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful doe. Let her breast always satisfy you, be lost in her love forever. Why, my son, would you lose yourself with a forbidden woman or embrace a wayward woman? For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes and he considers all of his past. A wicked man's iniquity will trap him. He will become tangled in the ropes of his own sin. He will die because there is no discipline and be lost because of his great stupidity. Now, there's two things I want, to, want you to take away from that passage. One is don't misunderstand what God is saying when the breast of your wife should always enrapture you. He's not saying that your wife is never going to age. He's saying, again, that all your sexual gratification comes from the one vessel that I have provided you. That is why he's talking about discipline in the man's life. And the other point I want, that is the easiest way to ensnare a man. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but until you put a man in the grave, this is something you have to address. I just, two weeks ago, I put a 59-year-old man in jail, not just me, but a, our task force, put a 59-year-old man in jail for child porn. So don't think that until a man goes in the grave, this is something that husband and wife need to address. Now, there's different rhythms, there's different kind of things, I got it. But don't ever get loose 
on this aspect of discipline in your life, as God said, it will entangle you. It is the easiest way to just lose your power as a man, to fall down that abyss. Now, there's an internal aspect I want to talk about in prizing our wives' beauty. Again, a lot of people like to get hung up on the weaker vessel. I don't think that's the point that God's trying to point out here. Obviously, he knows that she's not as physically aggressive, as physically as tenacious, strong. He, he made her. He knows this. I like the Brian Study Bible. Did a, uh, I like their version. They, they say here, husbands in the same way, treat your wives with consideration as a delicate vessel. Because think about it. If you have something priceless in your home, what do you do with it? Do you throw it out in the lawn, leave it on the floor? No. You put it away so it can be seen and you protect it. This is God's point. Women to him are priceless. If you've been given a wife, the Lord has given you one of the most priceless things you will ever have on this life. The relationship with a God-fearing woman who loves you and will put up with your stuff. God expects you to treat her as priceless as she is. He says in Proverbs 31, 30, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. And I can speak to this from personal knowledge. When I married my wife, um, I was 25. I mean, I was not bright. I don't know if I'm really much brighter than I was back then. But I was completely enamored by her beauty. I still am. And I had no concept of the character that she would have that would make her so valuable. I had no idea the amount of tenacity, loyalty, flexibility, uh, patience, forgiveness. No concept of what I was going to put that woman through in 15 years in the military, moving out here to Idaho, going to law enforcement, and just all the stupid things I've done. I mean, I've crashed a motorcycle in front of this woman. I've been bucked off a horse, knocked out. I mean, I've done some stupid stuff, and she still hasn't left. And I probably still do a few things there. I go down a mountain bike hill with preparation, stand. <laughs> and I'm not getting brighter, unfortunately. I had no, I, honest to goodness, I can tell you, I had no concept of how valuable she is because I had no clue of the character. I had an idea of the character. I had no idea of the strength of her character. And the Lord has humbled me beyond belief because of her amazingness. It truly does. And it's the cool thing about a relationship. And I say it again, having a wife, having a daughter, unlocks parts of your heart as a man that will never be unlocked when you don't have them. So before we move on to this next part, though, for those of you that are young men or those of you that are raising young men, this is why it is so important not to have sex before marriage. It is not, all of God's commands are phenomenal. Unfortunately, you don't understand their beauty until you obey them. And it's not until hindsight that you realize, wow, that's why I did it. Let me tell you as a young man, do not believe secular nonsense that, oh, well, I got to make sure she's good and bad and all this. That's the most idiotic thing that can be said. If you can't enjoy sex, you are a fool. But if you choose to have sex before marriage, you're not going to know who that person is. Trust me, you want to make sure that you enjoy each other's company because there's a day comes when things slow down. You've got to make sure you like each other. Sex is there so you can learn to live with each other. <laughs> All right? I was, this is a subject. If you're raising kids, you've, you've got to start addressing this with your kid because the world has, again, think of the magazine. Why is the culture so passionate about, about teaching alternate lifestyle nonsense to the kids when they're in kindergarten. Why? Because they want to hook them. Because once they got them in that, once you get somebody in that sexual lane, you have got them. 
We've got to fight that. We've got to teach them God's way, the biblical way. So let's get back to the next way. All right, it says here on, say, I think this is verse eight. Notice the key words here. With understanding, be of one mind, have compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted. Second way that we honor women is we pursue their heart. Now recognize that pursuit is a fundamental aspect of being a male. I mean, just think about it in nature. If you have little boys, you will spend your entire raising dealing with them going after something. Food, trouble, like it, dirt, it doesn't matter. They just naturally have, have a one-track mind of just, I need to be chasing something. Even nature, right? It's generally speaking, not always, generally speaking, uh, the male that is in pursuit of the female uh, in any particular breeding season. Now, that's kind of the, the natural. There's also a biblical aspect of pursuit. Genesis 2.24, who is the one who leaves and cleaves? Man or woman? Man or woman, who leaves and cleaves? The man. Thank you. The man is the one who pursues. It is the man's job to leave his family in pursuit of God's chosen bride for him. And if you just think about it logically, if you want to kill passion, kill the pursuit. Now I'm gonna go off in a, in a planned rabbit hole here because I have seen this passage. I, I've, I won't say counsel, that's too strong of a word. But I've had several conversations with people who who have either been a victim, a uh, victim, I don't want to use that word, but this passage has been abused. So I'm here in 1 Corinthians, um, let me see here, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 6. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And that's usually where people stop. All right, we're good. That's, that's it. My body. I'm always like, did you read the rest of the verse? Like, honestly. And likewise, the husband does not have, uh, oh man, I cut that out, didn't I? Awkward. Awkward. <laughs> did I purposely cut that out? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> oh, God, sense of humor. It's amazing. Okay. Verse three through six. There we go. Boop, 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 boop. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, I have, and maybe it's just anecdotal, but I've had more than two people come to me who have felt that this means they're, they can never say no to their husband. That's not what that passage says. What that passage says is you and a husband and wife must communicate with each other. And you're going to be different, but y'all need to compromise. And guess what happens when you compromise? You get to exercise the character of Christ and you get to be gracious and consider someone else before yourself. That is what that passage is saying. That passage does not in any way say, you as a wife must never say no to your husband under any circumstance. And in fact, every relationship that I'm aware of that has that kind of mentality, the husband is so, eh, eh, yeah, yeah. It is in our nature as males to pursue. I'm not saying women, you need to be any more challenging than you are. <laughs> Can I get a hallelujah there? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Whew. I'm just saying 
The, what God is saying is that husband and wife, you must communicate. And obviously, he's using sex as an example because whether you realize it or not, there's only one thing that makes a marriage relationship different from every other relationship, and that's sex. If I want to have a warm, friendly, great relationship, I got Lucas. All right? David and Jonathan loved each other. It was not some weird thing like secular society tries to make it out to be. They had a deep, passionate love for each other because you can have that. We should have that. That's why we're coming together as a family. But when it comes to a marriage, the only person that you can have sexual gratification with is through your wife. And God is just using this. As from, it's an argument from the greater to the lesser. Obviously, if God expects you two to communicate about the f most exclusive thing in the marriage relationship, he expects you to come together and communicate in everything. Raising kids, buying groceries, getting property, going out on a date, etc., etc., etc. And we pursue our wives through communication, which is so much fun. It is for me. I don't know about the rest of you guys. I love it. All right. Oh, not there yet. All right. So the other part, we don't just pursue her emotionally. Or let me say this. When we pursue our wives emotionally, I think one of the ways we struggle as men is that we forget our wife is not a dude. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there are some things if I said to Lucas, Lucas would probably punch me. No doubt. Sometimes females can express themselves verbally in a way where a guy's, where a husband's like, what? in the world did you just like we can be so offended because we're thinking about it as a in a macho -y macho a manny man way i truly believe not just from experience but just from seeing how things work not only do we have the responsibility of of reflecting christ but we also have the responsibility of reflecting god the father i mean he chose the title father we have not bestowed that upon him that is the title that he chose. So the very nature of us being a father is Im implicit that we will reflect that. One of the things of God the Father is he is our fortress. He's our rock. Now, I'm going to go out some, on opinion lane, which is kind of dangerous for a pastor, especially when we're talking about females, but just we're going there. Pastor Greg's my mentor, so if you disagree with me, feel free to uh, beat up on him later. <laughs> God made women with an emotional range that typically, it far surpasses what most men want to experience. <laughs> I like being happy, I like being hungry, and sleepy, that's pretty much me. I, like, I, I wanna be in one of those three boxes. And that's, that's the only boxes I like to jump in. I think it's healthy for women, and I just see this from experience of life and moving around. I think women, the more range of emotions they can experience, the just the healthier they are. God made women very emotional. This is not a, uh, a, uh, it's not a flaw by any means. In fact, it's a great strength. Because there are things that I, I struggle to express, right? There are things I deal with and I'm going to walk in a room and close the door and beat my head on the wall because I can't process the emotions that are going on. I mean, Lord, help me when my favorite chicken ninja dies. That's going to be a bad day. <laughs> um, but my wife can handle stuff so amazingly. So where, and this is my lesson for young men that I've, I've kind of come to learn. Just as God is our, our fortress and our salvation. So if you think of a, an emotional line, and, you know, Mr. Bob's good at this. You just want to be nice and even kill. And a mistake you'll make, especially early on in marriage, is if, if the emotional tension goes up, 
you treat that like a guy, like, oh, oh, you want to get angry? I can get angry too, right? And then you both get angry, and then it's, it's just fireworks, and it's, and it's insanity. As a man, learn that your wife just needs to express emotions. It's just how God made them. I've been amazed in my own personal life once, and it took me a lot of years to learn this. When she needs to express emotion, if I'll just stay even keel, she'll come back so much quicker. And here's the re- this is really why I believe the reason is why. Just as God is our fortress and salvation, we know as Christians nothing we do will ever take his love from us. And I think for women it's the same. When they know that no matter what emotion they're experiencing, how they act, they can always come to you as that safe harbor, that love. It gives them such security and stability. They're always going to be emotional. It's not going to go away. I'm not saying you're ever going to, it's not a problem to be fixed. I'm just saying you as a man have another opportunity to reflect the very grace and strength of God. You have the opportunity to be like a fortress and salvation of God the Father for your wife. So when she emotionally expresses herself, you're always there to say, I love you. I am always here for you. I don't care how you act. I will always love you. And that is true power when you start funneling God's love through your life like that. So that is the other way we pursue her emotionally. Now, devotionally, we'll blast through. You're the spiritual leader of the home. I was talking with Robin. She was talking about how she enjoys the fact that all four pastors here are so different. Because, you know, Rabbi Ken, as we call him, put on that wonderful uh, uh, Seder yesterday. It was just phenomenal. His attention to detail and his just, the way he puts things together is just marvelous. It's kind of like me, but opposite. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Pastor Greg is such a warm, loving man. He's so concerned. And, you know, Pastor Chris is so astute with social media and the political landscape and his administration. He's such an excellent leader at this church. I mean, we, we all reflect different things. And it's a microcosm of the church. We all have different spots we can plug in. And as a spiritual leader of your family, you need to pursue your wife devotionally as well. You need to figure out what it is that she needs. Where does she need to be plugged in to be part of the body of Christ? Does she need to be in hospitality? She definitely needs to be in nursery because we have a need for nursery. So feel free to step up in the nursery because we need some some people to help Miss Debbie out who's doing a phenomenal job. If you see Miss Debbie, please tell her, thank her and hug her for me. My point being, you have a role again as a husband. It's not just about what you're doing. Where does my wife fit? So looking back here, we're going to our final aspect of honoring our wives. You see here, it says being hairs together and you're going to be a blessing. So that last aspect, we protect her walk, both her daily walk and her divine walk, her walk with God. Now, again, I think the physical aspect is fairly easy, right? Just as it's easy to appreciate the physical beauty of your wife. I think it's fairly intuitive. It's fairly uh, straightforward to physically protect your wife. I don't think that's something I got to spend a lot of time preaching about. Now, that doesn't mean we all need to be a bunch of, uh, you know, Batmans or any kind of stuff like that. You know, I guarantee you no one's going to mess with Miss Carol. Because they look at Bob and, and know, recognize, like, that dude right there is going to gnaw my face off if he has to. Like, I can look at Bob and know that he is going to fight to the last sinner if he has to. That is why this culture is so enthralled with turning our boys into women. That's why they're so enthralled with neutering our boys. Because neutered boys don't stand up. They want to emasculate the society because weak men don't fight. I'm not saying I'm always right, 
but I'm ready to fight. And you give me a bunch of brothers with me, watch out. That is why this society is so passionate about neutering our men and our young boys. That is all this whole fervor behind toxic masculinity. Because they want to somehow, they recognize the problem. I can't get to your women because of all you men in the way. I can't get to your daughters and ruin your daughters because of all you fathers refusing to back down. We have got to be ready as men to be men of God, which means standing up for our wives, our daughters, our mothers. I truly believe right now there's no more important fight right now than for our women. You look at the first chapter of Romans, it's generally referred to as the wrath of abandonment. When God finally says, you know what? I'm done. Have your own ways. The men go sideways, and the last people to go sideways are the women. Once we've lost our women, we're done. When we get to the point where women no longer have a moral compass and no longer live with restricted lives, we have lost our society. David wasn't able to defeat Goliath because he sat around and did nothing. He was able to defeat Goliath because he lived a life of obedience. He took out the lion and the bear. He did the small things, so when the big thing came, he won. We here at Athel Baptist as men, we need to recognize the fight that is coming. And that fight is for our daughters and our wives. We need to take a very aggressive stand to say, this is what biblical manhood is. This is what biblical womanhood is. And we will not back down. And if you're saying, well, I don't know where I can do that. Well, we've got Love Cute and Drop Point Ministries where we can always use more men and women of God to come in here and influence our younger generation. You are always welcome to come take part in raising the next generation. We got a nursery. I already talked about it. I say this tongue-in-cheek, but I mean this. If you're not doing something either in a family, Drop Point, Love Cube, nursery, if you're not doing something to affect the youth, mentoring a, a parent is also within parameters. But if you're not doing something, don't complain about the future. Just accept what the future brings. But God gave you a talent. He gave us something. We need to get involved with the youth because they are stepping into, I mean, think about it. Most of you, I can look out and see, never when you went to the world at 18 years old, did you have to worry about a device like this that could take you to the very portals of hell. And I say that because we routinely target dudes who are doing very bad things, and this is their weapon. Don't think this is an important fight. God made men to be aggressive, tenacious, strong, because he wants fighters. Maybe 20 years ago during Billy Graham's golden age, we could have lived in a life where we would have just come to the church and not did anything. But that is not this age. This age that we're getting into is an age where Christians have to become fighters. We've got to be willing to fight for our women. The world wants us to buy into this toxic masculinity, all this wokeness nonsense. God says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you be do be done with love. Now, I know most of the men that I'm looking out here are more than willing to join me, more than willing to fight. I know that for a fact. And as Tim and the band comes up, what I want to inspire us to do, like David when he defeated the lion and the bear, start doing the small things, right? If you want God to call you to do something great like defeating Goliath, you've got to start with the small things, which starts with honoring the women that are in our life, prizing your wife's beauty, pursuing her heart, protecting her walk. 
Make it your mission moving forward. Tell your wife, lover, I am going to do my best to reflect Christ in our life. Will you come alongside me and help me? You can't do it without her help. That is why he gave her to you. Now, next week, we're going to talk about ladies, how you can be a woman of honor, according to the Bible. But today, especially, I just ask all of you in a marriage relationship, take some time to communicate. And if you have kids, think about the war that they're walking into. And if you don't have kids, you're here for a reason. If you don't have kids, you need to come along some parent and you need to to mentor them. I mean, we love the relationship we have with the Kates. They are such a blessing to us. Find somebody to join with. We are here together as a family. I hate to tell you, this world's only gonna get worse until Jesus comes back. I really think we're at the point where we might have a revival, hallelujah, if we do. But if we don't, we need fighters. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, I'm, my family, we're so blessed to be part of this Athel Baptist family. I thank you for each individual here. Lord, I thank you for everybody who has the courage to take a stand and come to a church and say, I don't care what's happening in the world, Lord. I am going to come to church. I'm, you're going to be my priority. This church is going to be my priority. I'm going to join together. I am going to fight for your truth until you call me home. I want to leave nothing on earth. I want to expend everything you have given me so that when you receive me in glory, I can hold my head high because I was more than a worthless servant who only did what I was commanded. Lord, I know I can't do it without your Holy Spirit that comes and lives within me. Lord, I just pray for this church that you indwell us, Lord, that you give us the power, you give us the vision so that we go out and we make a difference. And that difference starts at home. It starts with loving our wives. I pray that you help us to honor our wives. They are so priceless. They are so precious. Please give us the power, the understanding, and the passion to show them that through your love, through your life, Lord, that you love them so much. And that's your cue. That's enough talking. Amen. How funny.